Okay. <laughs> the first talk is the black dark matter and antimatter by Professor Dolgov. 40 minutes, please. Okay. Переключается почему-то. О, прекрасно. Ну, речь пойдет о так называемой черной темной материи. О, oh, sorry. I will talk about the black dark matter. It means dark matter completely made of black holes. Uh, I have an extreme point of view that all dark matter and pieces of all dark matter are black holes. Then I go. Uh, outline of my talk. So there will be many popular uh, explanations, since I believe not everybody uh, knows much details about the black holes, so do I. And the uh, uh, important thing will be um, discussion of antimatter in the Milky Way. It was a byproduct of our mechanism, suggested by Joe Silk, of um, that uh, antimatter could be quite abundant in the Milky Way, and uh, there are two striking predictions, namely, oops, excuse me, chest. No, uh, namely, that the model predicts log normal mass spectrum of primordial black holes, and abundant uh, antimatter, uh, well, uh, in absolute values, rather small amount, but still there is noticeable amount antimatter in the galaxy. And these two predictions seems to be quite well mm, supported by experiment. Okay. So, as it was stressed in previous, not previous, in the morning talk by Elena Arbuzova that nature of dark matter is not yet known, and there could be two large classes of dark matter, elementary particles with very huge mass interval, so-called axion-like particle with the masses of about 10 to minus 22 electron volts, up to 10 to power 13 electron volts by, as was stressed by, oops, by Elena. Okay. I, there is another class of objects what I'm going to discuss, namely so-called machos. That is generic form uh, uh, called massive astrophysical compact hollow objects. And most probably, most naturally, it is their primordial black holes, though there could be some people advocate idea of topological or nopological, not topological solitons and many others. And to say uh, about first class of elementary particles, they are called, so called WIMPs. WIMPs uh, in English means something very weak uh, and uh, macho, some strong. It is Spanish word. And another thing that there is, if we make public opinion poll, that overwhel overwhelming majority would vote for WIMPs. And there is mildly heretic point of view, I think. It's our point of view, black holes. I, I will do that. Okay. All, everything will be explained a little later. Just to <laughs> have intrigue, <laughs> wait, <laughs> at least you won't leave too early. Okay, so, and uh, there could be eclectic point of view, saying that they're both 
matches and the wimps are allowed, but uh, it's, I think, against famous Okama River, but who knows. And so what I will um, discuss, it's uh, dark matter consisting 100% of black holes. It's, there are a lot of objections, but I think it may be true still, so-called black dark matter. Okay, let's go further. Oh, the first suggestion, as far as I remember, no, was made by Stephen Hawking in his paper about uh, so-called, it is primordial black holes, uh, that great, uh, formed, created in the very early universe, and they, they could be dark matter particles. It was main content of his paper. It was not really uh, uh, well-based, because uh, the, such black holes as he suggested uh, could evaporate, and at that time, Hawking effect was not discovered by him. Okay, next, later by Chaplin, George Chaplin, I think, noticed, uh, he simply noticed that primordial black holes formed in the very early universe before uh, formation of stars could make be um, dark matter particles. He assumed very simple uh, scale independent spectrum and it is very far from reality. And the maximum mass was at the order of 10 to power 22 grams. And this is good because this uh, range of masses are not, are not for forbidden. It's not forbidden. Now, uh, I make slight boasting that the first realistic model of black dark matter and moreover tested by experiment, experiment I mean observation, astronomical observation, was our paper with, with Joe Silk, abbreviated as DC, DS, and also next one several years after by um, written together with Masahiro Kawasaki and Nina Kevlishvili, and uh, in both papers, it was first application of inflation to formation of black holes. And this allows to make really huge monsters with very large masses. In our case, it's about 10 solar masses. And if you remember, um, if I remind you of the paper by Chaplin, he, he has masses of 10 to power 22 grams. Okay. Oops. Okay, let me see what's next. Ha. Ha. Very good. So it was our, our mm, contribution where we apply inflation, which allows to make really huge black hole masses. It is the famous uh, constraints summary of constraints in the review, oh, sorry, <coughs> by uh, Carr, Bernard Cart and Florian Kunel uh, on possibility of allowed region for um, the black hole masses. If you see, um, if you look here, it is masses about around 10 to power 20 grams, absolutely allowed. There is, um, I would say, conventionally allowed region of 10 solar masses, which I'm especially interested in, and uh, very huge black holes are also allowed by several sets of observations. I skip the explanation of that. Important thing here is that, uh, as mentioned, uh, Bernard himself, all the models, all the limits are model dependent and have really serious caveats, shortcomings, and there could be, uh, well, one could take all these limits uh, with caution. There was uh, several papers already after uh, new data by Web Space Telescope were published by Boehm and Tal, and uh, that um, if one neglect LIGO bounds, I, I will tell what is LIGO, and uh, then there is uh, all the, the limits with masses of order of 10, 100 solar masses are allowed, and Korean and Frampton that 
maybe we shouldn't consider taking into account CMB distortion in that case also super black holes forbidden by uh, Carr and Kuchner also allowed. Okay. Oh. Uh, another thing is was as argued by Sergey Rubin uh, in 2001 <laughs> that black holes uh, are do like uh, to make clusters and if they indeed are in clusters then dynamics is completely different and using uh, the result by Sasaki and Ta et al uh, recent analysis by Yeroshenko and Stasenko uh, lead to conclusion that 100 percent of dark matter in the form of black holes here is this number seems to be also allowed not excluded okay now I, for some reason, went back. Uh, now a little, little bit piece of history that the uh, country person John Mitchell, или Michelle, British, uh, who also was famous for many interesting uh, insights of uh, different fields in physics, uh, noticed that there could be stellar bodies with so strong gravity that uh, first cosmic velocity is smaller than speed of light. And in that case, this, these objects would not emit anything and they would not be seen. He called them dark stars, as it is written here. And he said that the possible way to observe this object is to see a star rotating around nothing. And there's nothing non seen could be a black hole. And this is how some black holes are observed in many, many cases. And there are also very many different way to possible way to observe black holes in at the present day. First of all, black holes evaporate, though nobody's yet seen it, and it's not, maybe not very interesting for us, because if they are if they evaporate, they don't make noticeable contribution to dark matter. Another thing is gravitational lensing by black holes. These objects are not absorbed. It's very famous so-called machos, the same special class of objects, invisible, with masses of a half of solar mass. It doesn't fit any reasonable model of black hole formation, but no other explanation, as far as I know, exists for the for their observations. They are absorbed by uh, looking, for example, at stars in Magellanic cloud. People indeed do that, and at some moment, velocity of star increases um, by three or five. And what is important, it was uh, the curve was the same for red and blue color. If there is variable star, first of all, the curve is not symmetric and it's color dependent. So there's something invisible and which cannot be dead stars. In that case, it would be too many of them and absolutely unknown how they can be formed. So there is one of the problems which can be explained by primordial origin of those black holes. There are some other things, of course, quasars, which are very well absorbed objects, quasi-stellar objects. They radiate as, uh, well, a thousand times more uh, light than uh, normal galaxies, though they are practically point-like. Uh, the size of quasar is uh, maybe a few astronomical, maybe not more than 100 astronomical units. Astronomical units is about eight, eight minutes distance from the sun to the earth. Okay, and uh, some uh, quasars keep on shining, any massive black hole do, eating matter around, but at some stage this hungry creature it, it ate up everything and all consumed all the food around and uh, what, what 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 happens with the mm, quite massive black hole in uh, center of our galaxy mass of about five million solar masses and for comparison the 
most massive black hole is 100 billion solar masses. So our massive, supermassive black hole is a kind of dwarf, but there are very many of them and uh, not all of them emit radiation. Okay, however, strictly speaking, existence of black hole was not proven observationally. What was proven that there is some excess of mass and this was the only thing was known. And if we use general relativity, then there must be black hole. But many people say, of course, it should be. It is very good, but it's better to make direct experimental uh, proof that there are indeed black holes. And recently, two years ago, it was indeed found that what we observe, at least in some cases, are surely black holes. Uh, they, I am going to talk about registration, very well known registration of gravitational wave uh, for from the pair of coalescing objects. It could be black holes or not black holes, which rotate in emit gravitational radiation. And the best fit to the to the data is um, achieved shape of radiation, intensity, time dependence. If there are a, a a pair of rotating black holes, and even there's with Schwarzschild metric, and even with their spins and uh, masses, initial mass and final masses can be observed this way. Okay, now what uh, what is known about black holes theoretically? Uh, immediately after Einstein discovery of general relativity there was found it was 1915 and already in 1916 the solution of so-called uh, Schwarzschild metric was found it describes theoretically describes black hole with zero quantum number black holes are known to have three quite kind of hairs hair means something which can be observed outside one is mass Newton, Newton limit, for example, completely determined by mass. Second is rotation. In general relativity, gravitational field of rotating body is somewhat different from non-rotating. So spin can be measured. And the last, the last one is electric charge. So Coulomb field normally exists, and it is at the existence, it is just normal Coulomb field. Uh, it is just funny thing that if photon mass is non-zero no matter how small it is a little bit then uh, colonic field completely disappears there is no continuous limit for uh, tiny colon tiny mass of photon there is no colon field in stationary solution and if uh, electric field would be found, it means that photon mass is exactly zero. And the, maybe the best observation on it. There are three types of black holes by formation mechanism. First is well known as so-called astrophysical black holes. I will discuss relations between astrophysical and so-called primordial black holes. They are formed by uh, mm, more or less intuitively clear process, then a star exhausted, completely exhausted its fuel. And if it is massive enough, then uh, the process of collapse does not stop at neutron star, but gravity is so strong that it breaks down all Fermi pressure, Fermi repulsion, and turns into black holes. It is so-called astrophysical black holes. And uh, masses of them, should be around three solar masses. And what is interesting, uh, uh, below 100 solar masses. I picked out that because probably, presumably, the coal with 100 solar mass was discovered uh, a year ago. And uh, from the point of view of standard of physics, it's impossible. To make 100 solar mass black hole, we must have very massive star. And it is... Uh, uh, Enriched by metal, when it collapsed, it uh, emitted practically all its mass and comes to uh, the final state with mass considerably smaller than 100 solar masses. But now 100 solar mass is absorbed and uh, 
there are some, I would say, exotic explanations are suggested. What I, uh, that's what Larry said. Another one are black holes, massive or super, supermassive black holes. They are formed, formed according to the standard law uh, by the um, density accretion to the to galactic center. Assume that there is a small excess of density in galactic center. It takes more and more matter. And after a while, it is believed that the black holes with masses of 100 million or even up to 100 billion solar masses is formed. There is one but, namely that Necessary time with the standard accretion mechanism is approximately uh, 10 or 100 times longer than in the universe age. So uh, something else is probably necessary, but uh, now, okay, that's the problem. 14.6 uh, billion years is not enough. Now what was... Um, uh, plenty of supermassive black holes was discovered by Hubble Space Telescope and later by James Webb Space Telescope when the universe age was 10 times less. And if it is not enough time to make a black hole during 15 billion years, then the universe was less, younger than 1 billion years or 500 million years is even much more difficult. It is so-called uh, problem with the Lambda CDM cosmology created by James Webb, I think also by Hubble's telescopes. Then there are so-called primordial black holes, what I'm going to talk. This, uh, such black holes were uh, suggested existence by Zeldovich and Novikov in 66. And the idea was the following. Assume that there is, normally it is assumed that density is more or less homogeneous. And by chance there could be density excess. And if delta rho over O of order of unity at the so-called cosmological horizon, at the scale equal to, roughly speaking, to the universe age, then it is simple. Uh, algebra one can uh, show that this density excess happened to be inside its own Schwarzschild radius. That's how primordial black holes, roughly speaking, are formed. And uh, later, the, uh, this idea was elaborated by Hawking and Karen Hawking, but first paper was, uh, was suggestion, suggestion was done by Zildovich and Novikov. Uh, there is conventional division between black holes, just terminology uh, related to their mass. Masses from millions up to 100, in fact, up to infinity, but uh, the most massive was 100 billion solar masses is uh, called supermassive black holes, abbreviation SMBH. Another so-called intermediate mass black holes from 100 to 100 solar masses, big range. And uh, surprisingly, these black holes Nobody expected them for a long time, and now they're found practically everywhere. And so, in the last of the list, so-called solar mass black holes uh, from uh, fraction or maybe solar, of solar mass, fraction is very difficult, up to 100 solar masses, slightly less than that. 100, as I said, was believed impossible. Now, clever theorist invented many, many ways. Okay, so I repeat that intermediate mass black holes are appearing every day and night, uh, but um, the abundances uh, are supposed to be quite low. Okay, uh, next thing is about inflation. As I said, normally before uh, people guess that using inflationary period to make very massive black holes, uh, black holes, primordial black holes were supposed to be quite light, but uh, there was, I think, in our paper uh, uh, with um, Joe Silk, and later was paper by 
several authors. Next, next one, Carr, Hilbert, and Litze. Next it was Ivanov, Novikov, and Nasielski. So they ultimately came to the same uh, conclusion that if you want to make massive, prim very massive primordial black holes formed in very early universe before star formation, then we need inflation. Okay, in all the models except ours, spectrum looks very cumbersome, very difficult to understand, not a no nice analytical experience. There are some integrals, and they have quite terrible form. In our case, we predicted spectrum which has log, log normal form, uh, number density of <laughs> it's slightly different physics, <laughs> but okay, yeah, but we didn't use Sudakov variables. <laughs> Good answer. Okay, so um, the form is very simple. Uh, this mu squared is parameter with dimensions of mass. We don't, we cannot predict it, but we can, for example, using data and knowing number of different kind of black holes to estimate that. And uh, what we can do, and also gamma of different analysis is leads to gamma of order of unity, but there are some other data which is questionable, I will mention it, with gamma around 30. In that case, it contradicts data of observation of um, very massive black holes. What we can do, we may predict the value of m sub zero, and the idea is the following. We assume that black uh, that at inflationary stage, very large perturbation in chemical content in baryonic number were created. We use so-called, in framework of so-called African dyne baryogenesis, I will mention that in more detail later. And uh, these perturbations in baryonic number, since quarks were massless, did not lead to any noticeable density perturbations. Chemical content was very much different, but density contrast was zero. And only at QCD phase transition, when quarks become massive, the bubbles with big baryonic number became, uh, have very strong density contrast. And because of that, we can predict this quantity M sub zero, which is equal to mass inside horizon, uh, inside horizon at QCD phase transition. That is at temperatures 100, or maybe 150, uh, MeV, and in fact, uh, this prediction is in a very good agreement with experiment. I will say it later. Uh, now I'm coming a little bit to what I said. That uh, as I said um, before, data of LIGO uh, and Virga and Kagra. After all, uh, nobody. Uh, was sure that we have indeed black holes that just some excess of mass. But the uh, analysis of the shape of the signal uh, lead to conclusion that indeed the source of gravitational waves, these two rotating objects, indeed possessed Schwarzschild metric at the initial and final stage. So the numerical um, uh, Analysis showed that the best fit corresponds to the sol to Schwarzschild solution. Okay, let's go. Okay, let's go further. Ah, now there is some. I uh, said that observation supports this idea with log normal mass spectrum. It is analysis of so-called chirp mass distribution. The luminosity of binaries, at least in the spiral regime, is given by expression which is proportional to chirp mass in power 10 over 3. This is the result. It is more or less trivial thing, you have in spiral regime very slowly uh, decreasing radius of binary and then they solve a, a practically Newtonian approximation and find what this result about chirp mass. The chirp mass expression is 
very funny m1 by m2 3 over 5 and m1 plus m2 1 over 5 and distribution on the basis of the like data was checked in our paper with many people from Gaish, Gasudar State Institute, State, Stenberg State Astronomical Institute. And uh, we found that the best fit is obtained with M sub zero equal to 17 solar masses in very good agreement with the prediction of QCD prediction. And uh, if we have astrophysical black holes, they do not fit the data. Now we can see these are blue. What is this? Not dot, but lines, short lines is the, are present the data. And red line is the best fit with M sub zero equal to 17. And we can compare it with the data under assumption that, uh, um, that of chirp distribution of astrophys several models of astrophysical black holes. There was uh, more detailed analysis made later by Pasnov, Kudranov, and Mitishkin. There, they found double um, population that some of black holes, green line, are astrophysical, most probably, but fit of parameters is rather strange. And the rest, which is here, is uh, our primordial. With parameters, they found uh, the best fit with some question mark, GABA equal to 10. In that case, super heavy black holes are not created. Okay. Next thing is so-called crisis in cosmology, which was uh, born by um, James Webb telescope. In fact, it was first by Hubble Space Telescope that uh, they say that uh, in the universe, with the age of 500 million years, uh, half a billion year, yes, to speak about Hubble Space Telescope, it is very densely populated with different objects. And uh, it is, they say that it is a strong crisis lambda, with lambda CDM cosmology, and I'm not going to discuss it more. But what we said, in fact, it was predicted that in our paper with Josil and the Kawasaki and Kavlishvili that there must be universe or the universe must be populated with galaxies and everything simply because we have uh, seeds of galaxy formation uh, formed in a very early stage at QCD phase transition, roughly speaking. Okay. Uh, what I want to stress at this uh, transparency that we um, assumed by conjecture that uh, uh, important mechanism of formation of galaxies and very massive black holes is the process of seeding. That, for example, um, supermassive black holes is a seed for galaxy formation. Standard model is galaxy first formed and due to accretion in the center their supermassive black hole can be formed with but our approach was absolutely difficult different we assumed that first supermassive black hole was formed and later on it attracted and seeded a lot of matter it was uh, uh, nobody mentioned that it may be true but recently there under pressure, then, okay, time is running, okay. Under pressure of the data, there was uh, several papers in favor of the seeding. In seeding. By the way, we have paper with uh, Pasnov, Mitishkin, and Simkin, that there could be not also massive galaxies, but also dwarf galaxies and global clusters may be seeded by um, some uh, 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 relatively light black holes with the masses about uh, 10,000 solar masses. Okay, uh, recently I would to repeat that the idea of seeding was rediscovered in several recent papers by Leo and Brom, and also by uh, several papers where Bogdan is a co-author. They completely write, explicitly write that maybe we can 
explain early formation of galaxies and black hole if they are seeded by super heavy super heavy seeds seeded by seeds okay go there is another paper by the same group they say that they need seeds to make supermassive black holes and they need to make seeds to to have seeds of somehow formed previously black holes, but their assumption is rather strange. They say that there could be a, a cloud of hot hydrogen and direct collapse of this hydrogen could create million or maybe hundred thousand or thousand solar masses black hole. It is a very questionable thing. And I talked to um, a normal astrophysicists and they say that it is practically impossible to make this direct collapse. But there was no other way. These people uh, reason absolutely hate this idea. But adverse picture is very well works. And also we checked that uh, global clusters can be seeded by primordial black holes. At that time, nothing was ob observed in the center of these global clusters. Now there are several global clusters there it is observed. Okay, now I think I skip this. There is a very nice uh, recent development, uh, not re directly related to my talk, and so-called pulsar humming. So pulsar st started to think. And in fact, there are the, the explanation of that the following, that pulsar emit very funny, very well-defined radiation correct with fixed fre frequency. And if there is gravitational wave coming to that, this radiation is modulated by some uh, higher, higher frequency uh, shape. Uh, that is very well observed and uh, explanation most popular that there are double systems of black holes with intermediate mass and they are created nobody says and except for us we said that these double systems are predicted okay maybe i skip that and also skip this think about mm, say a few words about antimatter. It was when I spoke about prediction of our model with Joe Silk and said that there could be antimatter, reaction of audience was mildly, politely that this crazy guy speaking some garbage and now it is observed. And his history is rather interesting that it was uh, first search for antimatter in the galaxy was by Konstantinov, nuclear physicist who was director of uh, Physical Technical Institute at that time. Despite of heavy criticism of Zildovich, they have very good personal relation, I would say. Uh, Zildovich was married to the sister of Konstantinov, but Zildovich said, it's completely stupid. Antimatter could not be in the galaxy. But it happens that indeed it happens. It, it could be possible. And there was a lot of history related to pay work by Staker, who uh, spoke about antimatter in the galaxy. OK. OK. Now, there was uh, Paul Dirac, who discovered of antimatter, saying that there could be anti-stars and there could be equal number of stars and anti-stars uh, may, maybe but it's not necessary and then we go further away and there was in fact like a joke another person who said about antimatter uh, arthur schuster in 88 or 98 18, 98 who said that there could be uh, other side electricity and then there could be, mm, mm, so-called antimatter, he said, and the matter and antimatter could annihilate in close contact, ejecting huge energy. Okay, the limits are relatively weak on the amount of anti-stars in the galaxy. It was realized many several years ago in our papers with Bambi, Blinnikov, and Pasnov. The bounds are so weak because the 
annihilation proceeds on the surface of the star because of very small mean three paths. And only looking exactly at that star, you can see excess of radiation. It was exactly what found. First of all, there is huge flux of anti of positrons in the galaxy, but there could be normal, I would say, explanations, though there is some problem with uh, uh, IMS data. Another thing is uh, uh, observations of antinuclei. Antihelium, uh, practically impossible to, to create in secondary collision in the galaxy. That's why I will ask in the morning this question. And there is huge amount of antihelium and antideuterium. Okay, now, we see, uh, I skip that. There is another thing, observations of anti-stars. This is a reference to the paper of 2021. And this nice picture, about 14 so-called anti-stars were observed by excessive gamma ray radiation from their surface, which more or less corresponds to five, uh, to maximum in the range of 500 MeV, which corresponds to P anti -pianulation. It was our suggestion, uh, paper Bonder, Blinikov, Bikov, and Pasnov, that there could be another process, very nice, namely that proton and antiproton do not annihilate like that. They form protonium. And the jump from level to level is emitting very well defined kill electron volts lines. And it is possible, in principle, may be observed by Erosita, or, but at the moment it's not. Very well. Another thing, uh, the analysis was in a recent paper with uh, the same group uh, that uh, observations of uh, anti 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 nuclei best can be explained if there are anti supernova explosion. It is the best explanation according to this very. Uh, respectful authors. Okay, now uh, a few things about construction uh, that we suggested that there exist so-called uh, African kind, Af for African dying kind of baryogenesis, namely that there could exist uh, that supersymmetry like theory, there could be scalar with non zero baryonic number and super partner of quarks. And this uh, generic at high energy um, supersymmetry, there exists so called flat directions in the potential. And this field chi could travel due to quantum fluctuations. Massless field are infrared unstable in the space spacetime and reach very large value. And when inflation over, it returns back and always started to rotate about origin and it could create huge baryonic number. What we did, it's um, that we introduce new interaction of high field with inflaton field, phi, is in capital phi is in flaton and phi one is some value which in flaton passes during inflation. It is our, it is fine tuning of the model, and when phi is close to phi one, the gate to flat direction is open. It acts like a mass of in, for, of field chi, and during this period, chi may go far away, and when inflation. Phi evolves beyond that, then potential became like that, and chi evolves down, creating bubbles with huge baryonic numbers. So the picture is like that, that the universe looks like Swiss cheese up, upside down, that empty spaces are bubbles with high baryonic number, there are mostly black holes, and there could be something else like uh, 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 early stars. Okay, there are many, many early stars, and I I think I skip that. But here is already about Swiss cheese thing. And uh, so results are the following that we have in this model log normal mass spectrum, which is very well confirmed by experiment. There could be formed compact stellar like objects, maybe very old stars, which are also observed in the galaxy. And then there could be uh, hydrogen and anti anti-hydrogen and helium clouds, but since their annihilation proceeds in the volume, they disappear to our time, and then beta can be negative, producing compact anti-stars, 
and uh, anti-black holes. And then there could be extremely old stars, even uh, one of stars which is observed being older than the universe. So there is about 10 standard deviation older uh, if Hubble parameters uh, correspond to short universe age. Okay, so what I want that uh, the mechanism pretty well agrees with the data by spectrum, by existing of with the data of antimatter in the galaxy. And so we can believe that it needs solve the problems created by Hubble Space Telescope and James Webb. Okay. That's a very optimistic conclusion that dark, dark matter may be 100% made of primordial black holes. They rescued lambda medium cosmology and prediction of antimatter crazy prediction is also confirmed. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very interesting, very impressive talk. <laughs> so I am out of time. Alexander Zakharov, please. Uh, okay, Alexander Dmitrich, do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Ah, okay, fine. It's uh, I was enjoying your talk uh, really, but I would like to 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 mention a few things. First, you know, you quoted George Chaplin as uh, one of the founder of these studies, but I would like to remind that in two thousand four, Chaplin and his co-authors wrote that black holes do not exist. And so it was all even discussion in nature of this paper. So because it has to be de uh, described with the quantum gravity, that is the reason. Second thing, you, you correctly mentioned that we could evaluate only mass inside closed orbits. But a few years ago, gravity collaboration observed motion of blobs near the last stable orbit in the galactic center. And these orbits are consistent with geodesics in Schwarzschild metric. So in this case, it was very strong confirmation that is really black holes. And also about shadows. About what? Shadows in M87 star in the galactic center. They are consistent with black hole model. And practically, we are checking black hole predi predictions, expectation, until last photon orbit. So everything is fine. But of course, some skeptics are saying that bosonic stars are also fine. It's true. It's still uh, very fine. And also one thing about Schwarzschild and GR creation. You know, uh, uh, in uh, uh, GR equations for, empty, for vacuum was, was written, were written uh, in uh, 19... So, I'm sorry, I need to stop you because we have no time. I propose to postpone your comments and your questions you can, for the general right. discussion because we have no time. I'm really Thank you sorry. for the comment, but in, if you can uh, send me a mail, it will be okay, okay, fine. Me. But as for impossibility in quantum gravity, I honestly speaking, I don't trust quantum gravity. <laughs> it's not existent science. Alexander, I'm really sorry. We need okay. to thank, thank you, Nikhail. Uh, Please send me mail. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have typed three questions in chat. Uh, maybe uh, you can answer in chat to my questions. Okay, we will try to do that. Okay. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Now we are going to start the next talk. The next talk will be done by Philip Meinheim. Do you hear me? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, yes, absolutely. I'm just getting my, I'm just getting the screen share ready. Yeah. Find it. Move. Just a second. Oh, what happened there? One second. Please wait a second. Either. Okay, good. Please share your screen. Yes, I'm trying to. <laughs> I'm trying okay. to. One second. Um, let me cancel that now. Let's do another screen share. Oops. Okay. Ah, good. Got it. Um, 
Okay, that's that's visible to everyone. Yeah, we see. Okay, uh, so good. please, please yes, don't forget. Uh, I need to say, uh, unfortunately, you have forty minutes. We left okay. five minutes for discussion. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, thank the organizers for this kind invitation. And I want to talk about a topic which seems as though one shouldn't even be thinking about it. Is the vacuum actually normalizable? And I'll show you that it relates very much to the question of high derivative gravity. Um, it's a topic that has been discussed by uh, Dr. Krasnikov and Dr. Shapiro. And I believe uh, Dr. Rachwal will talk about it a little bit in his talk. Um, let me give you the outline of the talk. Is the Dirac norm omega omega finite? How could it not be? Specifying an action and canonical commutators does not fix a Hilbert space. The Hilbert space is what the operators act on, and that doesn't you don't know that yet. We need to find a Hilbert space in which the Hamiltonian is self-adjoint. Setting Hij is Hji star only makes sense if H is self-adjoint when it acts on the Ij basis. Otherwise, you can't integrate by parts and throw away surface terms. So everything depends on boundary conditions. That's the key to understanding the Hilbert space. I'm going to present a procedure to determine whether or not omega omega is finite. And I'll show you that it's finite for a standard second order derivative bosonic field theory. And the method is to rewrite quantum field theory as a first quantized theory, as a derivative theory. I'll show that the same norm is not finite in a fourth order theory. And in that Hilbert space, the Dirac inner product, the Hamiltonian is not self-adjoint. I will show you that there's another norm, which is the overlap of a ket with its CPT conjugate, as opposed to with its emission conjugate, and that is finite. And in that Hilbert space, this norm has no states of negative energy and no states of negative norm. I'll show you that this, uh, this is finite for a fermion theory. I'll discuss the issue from the perspective of path integrals. And somebody mentioned path integrals earlier this morning. The Wick rotation to the Euclidean case and show that in the fourth order theory, the contribution of the Wick rotation contour circle at infinity is not only not zero, it is even infinite. I'll show you how you understand what I'm doing from the perspective of Dyson Wick. And, and at the end, I'll discuss what it has to do with quantum gravity. Okay. There's a hidden assumption in quantum field theory. We take a, a neutral scalar field, very simple action, and a wave equation, a Hamiltonian, and a canonical commutator. We introduce uh, uh, frequency modes, and we can write the um, expand the field in a, in a basis of A's and A daggers, and they obey the conventional delta three uh, commutator, and we construct the Hamiltonian as A dagger A plus A A dagger. That's completely conventional. We then introduce a state omega that A annihilates, and we can identify it directly as the ground state of H. However, that does not specify the norm. We don't know that simply from knowing that A annihilates it. Now, let me see why that becomes a relevant question. For the same theory, you introduce a propagator with a delta function. You write it as a Fourier transform, and you'd like to identify it as the expectation value of the time order product in, the set, in that vacuum. You apply the differential operator to it, use the field commutators, and you find that it's not exactly equal to delta four, it's equal to the matrix element of omega in the vacuum times delta four. Therefore, you can only identify this quantity as the propagator if you've been able to show that the ground state matrix element is in fact finite. Now, the reason why this could even come up as a concern is the propagator that satisfies a differential equation is a C number. When you try to identify it as a matrix element of a quantum field operator, you can't do that. You can't go from a C number to a Q number. You can go from a Q number to a C number. If you know this is the propagator, then of course, then you can establish 
that that's what it is. But you can't go that you can't construct a quantum Hilbert space by only knowing a, um, some 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 C number quantities. And so there's a jump in our in our assumptions in when we deal with quantum field theory in assuming that we can construct the Hilbert space from the from the structure of the propagator. And of course, that's the whole issue in higher derivative theories, such as using a pauli villars propagator. Precisely, you have the C number and you make a guess as to the to the Q number. And what Carl Bender and I have shown is that you've made in using this form, you've made the wrong guess because you hadn't checked the boundary conditions. And they will show you that those boundary conditions are not finite. And this norm is not finite either. So this is a hidden assumption. So now we have to ask, well, how on earth do we ever determine what is the norm of the vacuum? So to do that, I have to do, I have to go back to quantum mechanics and then generalize it to field theory. In quantum mechanics, life is very simple. The Hamiltonian is P squared plus Q squared. The commutator is QP is I. We set P as minus I D by DQ solve the Schrodinger equation, and we get a ground state energy, which is a half, and a wave function, e to the minus q squared over 2, which is nicely uh, well behaved. We go into occupation number space, we write q is a plus a dagger, p is a dagger minus a, we find that a with a dagger is 1, and we introduce the no particle state that a annihilates, and it also has energy a half, just as we would want it to have. However, that doesn't tell us what the norm of that state is. It doesn't oblige it even to be finite. To fix the norm, we need to relate the ground states, this one and this one, in the two bases. To do that, since A is Q plus IP over root two, we set Q A vacuum, which is Q plus D by DQ vacuum equals zero, and find that the overlap of Q with the vacuum is indeed e to the minus q squared over 2. We now calculate the norm. We introduce, we put it in a complete set of position eigenstates. We've identified q psi as psi 0. That's psi 0 star. That's the integral dq, e to the minus q squared, which is root pi. And we've established that the Dirac norm of the no particle state is finite. Finally, we can divide by pi to the quarter, and we normalize it to 1. Why were we able to do this? because we know the form of the wave function. So what's the, what's the message here? The procedure is straightforward and familiar. It works because both the wave function basis and the occupation number basis have something in common. They are both based on an infinite number of degrees of freedom. So in the occupation number space, we can re represent creation annihilation operators as infinite dimensional matrices labeled by vacuum, a dagger vacuum, a dagger squared, and so on. For the wave function basis, we can use a continuous variable that varies between minus infinity and infinity. The two sets of bases are both infinite dimensional. One is discrete and the other is continuous. The advantage of the continuous basis is that it enables us to express the normalization of the vacuum as an integral right here with an infinite range and then we can check, does the integral converge or does it not converge? And that way we can determine the normalization of the vacuum. Now, what about field theory? For field theory, we have an occupation number space, but we don't have a differential wave operator space. So can we write quantum field theory in, in wave operator basis? Well, yes because we have the a's and the a daggers, we have the phi's and the phi dot is a delta function, but we can't realize this condition by setting phi dot is equal to minus i d by d phi. That just does not satisfy this relation at all. If we wanted to satisfy the relation, we'd have to identify it with a functional derivative with respect to phi. But let's see if we can work with ordinary derivatives. Now, we can certainly express the Hamiltonian in terms of creation and annihilation operators. That's what we had um, right at the beginning. We already have the, the representation in terms of the A's and the A daggers. So now I'm going to try to go the opposite direction to what I did with the non-relativistic oscillator. And 
introduce at each momentum state, A is Q plus IP, A dagger is Q minus IP, and the Hamiltonian becomes Q plus IP, Q minus IP. And now the QPK proper, uh, commutator is a delta function and each K. And so at each K, I can represent the P as a derivative operator. And then I have a Schrodinger theory for the Hamiltonian. This becomes a derivative operator. I calculate the overlap of QK, AK with the vacuum. It's Q plus D by DQ. And I identify in each QK state, the, um, the wave function is E to the minus Q squared. I calculate the matrix element of the, of the full vacuum. I have to multiply over the partial vacuums at each momentum state put in the complete set of states as before, and I find that it is one. So what I've been able to do is I've been able to show that by converting the Hamiltonian back to a differential form, I can now check for the normalization of the vacuum. And you'll be delighted to learn that, of course, in ordinary quantum field theory for uh, second order field theory, uh, everything works. OK, let me just warn you. If you ever do the Dyson Wick expansion, you would identify this uh, matrix element as, as this particular combination. That's a standard expression. You divide out by this quantity, and then you get it into the standard perturbative Wick form, where you can make Wick contractions and do perturbation theory. And if you just look at this equation here, you would say, oh, well, it doesn't matter whether the vacuum's normalized or not, because it drops out of the ratio. Well, the point is it does matter because you could only have divided by this quantity, by that matrix element, if it were finite in the first place. So is it finite? Well, we just expand it out as a power series in HI, and the first term is just omega omega. So if that term is not finite, this quantity is not finite, and the Dyson Wick expansion doesn't work. And we'll see in a moment that that's exactly what happens in fourth order theories. Uh, finally, since I can expand phi in terms of Q's and Q, uh, A's and A daggers, I can write the, the whole field as a differential operator. I can take an interaction and I can set up the entire quantum field theory as a Schrodinger problem. Of course, it's not going to be a particularly easier one because interacting field theories have always been difficult. But this at least allows you in principle to write down quantum field theory as a differential theory. Now, fermions. Fermions, we have anti-commutators. We can represent the Bs and the B daggers. They obey the Pauli principle. B squared is zero, B dagger squared is zero. We can represent them by finite dimensional matrices. So for fermions, we have finite dimensional matrices, and there's no issue with the normalization of the vacuum. The problem only appears for the, for the, for the scalar, for the bosonic theories, because we have to go to an infinite number of degrees of freedom. We, we, the A daggers keep on uh, 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 um, creating states all the way up to infinity. So now we've seen one theory where, uh, where life is nice, and now we're going to do a theory where life is not so nice. This is a fourth order quantum field theory. It's got a, a mass term, a kinetic energy, and it's got an acceleration term. It has a propagator that obeys a fourth order equation. We can write the propagator in this very famous form where it has this famous minus sign. And so it has all kinds of problems. The theory was first studied in the, as a quantum mechanics by Pysa Uhlenbeck in 1950, and it gave the propagator, which is the same one as the Pauli-Villars propagator, only now, instead of Pauli and Villars having two, field the two fields, one normal and one with, with the, the negative metric, the Pysa Uhlenbeck obtained the full propagator from one fourth order theory. At large k squared, this quantity behaves like one, of, one over k to the four, so it makes Einstein gravity power counting renormalizable. Now, you should notice that something special is happening here. In the standard perturbative approach to quantum Einstein gravity, the propagator is 1 over k squared plus 1 over k squared, not minus 1 over k squared. You never generate the minus sign in radiative corrections. And so Einstein gravity is never renormalizable on its own. This theory, as it stands, is renormalizable. 
We also note that all in the complex K0 plane, all the poles lie on the real axis. So whatever is the Hamiltonian that goes with this theory, its energy eigenvalues are all real. The standard I epsilon prescription that I use here causes positive energies to propagate forward in time and negative energies to propagate backward in time. So the energy spectrum is bounded from below. And with this I epsilon prescription, there is no Ostrogradsky type instability that would otherwise occur in a high derivative theory. Some of the pole residues are negative. That's the unitarity violating negative norm ghost problem. If we insert some n1 n1 minus some n2 n2 equals i into this propagator, we obtain n1 phi omega squared minus n2 phi omega squared and generate the minus sign. And so it looks like the minus sign is coming from a closure relation with negative uh, indefinite metric. Is this too high a price to pay for renormalizability? This has been a, a major question. However, there is one more feature of this propagator, something completely and utterly innocuous. The residues are finite. Now, if the residues are finite and the vacuum is not normalizable, then this cannot be the representation of the propagator. And I'll show you immediately that, the, that this vacuum here, the standard one that we use, is not a vacuum which is finite, and therefore the identification of D in this form is incorrect, and that does not describe this propagator. Something else will describe it. We'll have to replace the, the left side by the CPT conjugate of the right side. Then we will be able to generate the minus sign without ever having to worry about negative norm states. So this is the, this is the key feature, this uh, self-evident feature, the residues at the poles are finite. So I can work through, I, I can work through the theory, I can quantize it, the, the second order theory or the fourth order theory, I can quantize it, I can calculate the propagator, and I can show that it satisfies the differential equation only if vacuum vacuum is normalizable. So I need to know, is it normalizable? I have to find out. So what I do is I first of all, write the field theory in terms of creation annihilation operators. It's a fourth order theory. So I have two sets of uh, creation annihilation operators, calculate the Hamiltonian, use the standard commutation relations. And I find a dagger A plus a, a dagger minus a two dagger. So there's a plus and a minus sign. And that looks like I'm going to have trouble with negative energies. We'll see in a moment that that's not going to be the case because this second minus sign means that that minus sign and that minus sign um, compensate each other, which means the energy eigenspectrum is still uh, bounded from below, but we still have to worry about the negative sign in that commutator. So let me go down now to the quantum mechanics. So the trick we, we've seen, I first of all go into the quantum mechanics, I then rewrite the quantum field theory exactly the same way I wrote the quantum mechanics, and then I can check for the normalization of the vacuum. So, Pysen Uhlenbeck introduced the Pysen Uhlenbeck operator, z squared, z dot squared, and z double dot squared, equation of motion, z triple dot plus omega one squared omega two z double dot plus omega one omega two z squared is zero. What is this? This is the original field theory one with the spatial dependence frozen out, and we'll see how to put the spatial dependence back in a moment. Now, this theory is very interesting. It contains a z, a z dot, and a z double dot. That's too many for one oscillator, but not enough for two. So this system, despite its innocuous appearance, is a constrained system. So what we do is we introduce a new variable x equal to z dot. We introduce a, can a canonical conjugate px. We introduce Lagrange multipliers, use the method of Dirac constraints, and obtain the Hamiltonian px squared over 2 plus pzx plus omega 1 squared plus omega 2 x squared minus omega 1 squared omega 2 z squared, where z and pz are a canonical pair and x and px are also a canonical pair. Finally, we take the usual differential representation of the pz and the px as differential operators. 
solve the Hamiltonian, it's an ordinary Schrodinger problem, and we find that this is the ground state wave function. It converges in X, but it diverges in Z. So this wave function is not normalizable. So from the beginning, we discover that the Peiss-Uhlenbeck theory, where we work with the usual vacuum, um, which is the ground state of the Hamiltonian, the, eigen, the eigenfunctions are not normalizable. You could, by the way, construct a whole different set of wave functions which are normalizable, the, the plus sign becomes the minus sign. However, those states have energies that go down to, neg to negative infinity, and that's the Ostrogrodsky instability. So there are two sectors in the theory, one where the energies are not, where the wave functions are not uh, normalizable and the energies are bounded, and the other is the energy, the wave functions are normalizable, but the energy is unbounded. And those are two separate Hilbert spaces. So what we have to do is we have to recast this Hamiltonian. We have to do a lot of work. It's all, I've, I've posted everything on the website if you want to go through the details. We have, <clears throat> we, we have the, the Zs and the, the Ps and the Xs and the Px's. We write them as As and A daggers. We write the Hamiltonian as usual in terms of the A's and A daggers. And we check immediately that the, ma the matrix element of the ground state put in the state ZX is indeed infinite. We, we knew that immediately. Um, this is the wave function. Um, the wave function is not normalizable. And now we go to construct the field theory vacuum matrix element. And we find that it is infinite because the wave function was not normalizable. So what we've concluded is that the fourth order theory, quantum mechanics, is not a normalizable vacuum. So now let's go to uh, higher derivative field theories. Uh, basically, what happens is you work through exactly the same discussion as before, and we get the same Hamiltonian as we had a moment ago. The, um, we, we get the same Hamiltonian that we had a moment ago. That was for a single mode, and now we get the same Hamiltonian for a whole set of modes. There, there it is. And so what I've done is by introducing the Zs and the PZs, I've been able to convert the A's and A daggers back into these differential operators at all momenta. So for every momentum state, I can construct an equivalent wave mechanics. Uh, you won't be surprised to learn. It must be the case that when I calculate, when I do this, I represent the commutators by the, the differential operators, work through the story. I'm going to find that the vacuum, the vacuum norm of the, of the, the Dirac norm of the field theory is infinite. So the message is whatever is the normalization of the vacuum in the wave mechanical limit translates into the same normalization problem in the quantum field theory. So at this point, I hope I've, dis I, I've persuaded you that. Um, that uh, the theory is not well defined, the fourth order theory is not well defined. When a quantum field theory is written in terms of creation annihilation operators, change the basis to position of momentum operators, realize the momentum operators differential operators, set up an analog Schrodinger equation, and then check to see whether the wave functions are normalizable or not. Now, what happens if the wave functions are not normalizable? Then you can't integrate by parts and throw away surface terms. That means the Hamiltonian is not Hermitian because it's not self-adjoint. Can we use the Dirac inner product? No. Vacuum at T, vacuum at T is vacuum at T equals zero, propagates with E to the plus IH dagger T, vacuum propagates as E to the minus IHT. If H is not equal to H dagger, that norm is not time independent. So we can't use the Dirac norm in a theory where the Hamiltonian is not Hermitian, and we can't use a, a, um, the Dirac norm in a theory where the wave functions are not normalizable, and therefore the Dirac inner product is not the right one. Is there a better choice? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, there's a more general choice. We can look at the right eigenstates of the Hamiltonian and the left eigenstates of the Hamiltonian and calculate the left-right overlap the left transforms as e to the plus iht, right as e to the minus iht, and that one is preserved. So the left-right overlap 
is necessarily time independent. You can also show that it's equal to the overlap of the right eigenstate with its CPT conjugate, because CPT is also, the T also is antilinear, just like conju Hermitian conjugation is antilinear. That's very nice, but is it is it finite and is it positive? So I have to tell you what to do. Uh, I won't go through all of the um, issues, but remember, we showed a moment ago that the matrix element of A2, A2 dagger in the vacuum was negative because the commutator was negative. But if that's negative, then A2, A2 dagger cannot be a, con a modular squared, which means that A2 dagger is not the Hermitian conjugate of A. This notation uh, confuses you, but it's not the Hermitian conjugate. And therefore, the A's and A daggers are not conjugates of each other. And therefore, the Hamiltonian that's built out of them is not Hermitian. And so the suggestion that that number be negative only would apply if A2 dagger was the Hermitian conjugate of A2, but it isn't the case. And therefore, the, le the reasoning that causes you to think that we had negative norm states is simply not valid. That doesn't mean that we can solve the problem, but we've, we've diagnosed the problem. Uh, this was all worked out by um, myself and Carl Bender over the years, um, uh, using the PT theory that Carl had developed even earlier, starting as early as 1998, um, where he re replaces hermeticity by PT symmetry and more generally, I showed that you should replace it by CPT symmetry. Now, when you work through that, I'm not going to go through the details. Uh, it's all in the notes. Um, what you finish up with is you construct the right eigenstate and the left eigenstate. We have to do one thing. We have to make a similarity transformation of this form. And that sends um, IZ, Z, IZ to Y. Why do I want to replace Z by IZ? because the wave function was going like e to the plus c squared. And if I replace z by iz, it'll go like e to the minus c squared. So I'm making a continuation into the complex plane. And when I do that, I transform the z and its conjugate pz, but I don't, I don't transform the x because the e to the minus x squared was fine. And I finish up with this Hamiltonian with a minus iqx. Now you might say, ah, well, if I've got a minus i, then I can't possibly have a real eigenspectrum. But I must have a real eigenspectrum because the poles of the propagator were all on the real axis and a similarity transformation can't change that. So how can they be real? The answer is the Hamiltonian has a PT symmetry and the PT symmetry re results in energies being, re uh, be being real. We calculate with this new Hamiltonian the wave functions, the right one and the left one. We calculate the overlap, and the overlap is finite. And that's the first step that we wanted to show. The final step is we need to show that we have uh, that everything is positive. And when you work through, we, we, we introduce an A2 hat which is a change because we remember we transformed into the complex plane. And when we do that, that I translates into this commutator being positive as well as that one. And so this is the Hilbert space. That's the completeness relation. And um, not this, not the one that we commonly write down. It's, it's right left, not, not state and emission conjugate. We take the matrix element with the omega left. And allow me only to tell you, when you plug this relationship into that propagator, you develop the 1 over k squared minus m1 squared minus the 1 over k squared minus m2 squared. You get the minus sign coming from the fact that this, when you put in intermediate states, this is no longer a modular squared. And that's the thing that saves the theory. So we finish up with uh, a well-defined Hilbert space. Uh, probability is conserved. Matrix elements are finite and there are no negative norm states. And so the theory is completely um, is completely uh, sensible. I could take that Hamiltonian and apply this similarity transformation um, over here. And I just becomes P squared plus Q squared plus X squared plus Y squared, which is clearly 
um, uh, positive, definite, and well-behaved to, to oscillators. In fact, this similarity transformation has diagonalized the Hamiltonian. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll have to leave out all of this, um, but it's, it's all in the notes. Now, I want to say something about path integrals. If I write down the path integral from the th for the theory, I, I need to know, well, does it converge? Now, this oscillates, so that's not enough. I have to put in m1 squared and m2 squared, replace them by minus i epsilon minus i epsilon. And what I finish up with is a plus m1 squared plus m2 squared epsilon phi squared, which means that the path integral does not converge unless I continue phi into the complex plane and replace it by i phi. So from the path integral, immediately we see that the path integral does not converge if we work with real fields, but it does if we work with a purely imaginary field. And so this is basically a general statement. If you have a path into a, a Lorentzian path integral and it live and it exists with real fields, the underlying theory is Hermitian and the norm is the standard Dirac norm. If it doesn't exist with real fields, but you can continue into the complex plane to find in the complex plane that it does exist, then the Hamiltonian will still have the real eigenvalues as before, but now the norm will not be the, the Dirac norm, it will be the CPT theory norm. Okay. Now, what's very interesting about this theory is that when you go into the Euclidean time, in time zone, what you find is that the Euclidean path integral exists. And yet I just showed you a moment ago with real fields, the Euclidean path integral exists, but the, uh, but the you, Lorentzian one did not. What that means in making the wick rotation, usually we replace the horizontal piece by the vertical piece, but now we see something new. The contribution on the circle is infinite. It can't be ignored because you finish up with a finite answer. Start, you start with an integral on the real axis which is infinite and a, an integral on the imaginary axis, which is finite, which means that the contour contribution can't be, can't be neglected. And therefore this is a warning ab ab about Euclidean uh, path integral field theory. You simply have to be able to make the wick rotation and determine whether or not the, the Minkowski theory is sensible. Okay, now then, the very last remark, what does this mean for, um, for quantum gravity? The, let me take the standard Einstein theory and add on the Ricci scalar squared theory. I can work through the algebra. I find that the equation of motion is a G mu nu, which is the standard. I'm sorry, I need to remind you that you have five minutes. That's perfect. Okay. Uh, it's, the, it's the standard um, uh, Einstein tensor. The V mu nu is a higher derivative function of the Ricci scalar. We can expand around flat just to see what the first order perturbation looks like. We find that it, uh, that we take the trace to make like uh, to get rid of the indices and we find that the trace obeys a one over k squared minus a one over k squared minus m squared, which we initially would look at and say we have renormalizability, but we've sacrificed unitarity. But now we know that's not the correct procedure. We have to go into the complex plane. We can then re reconstruct a new vacuum, which uh, gives us a new inner product where the theory is well behaved. And then we can have this quantity be finite. Now, what this means is that you will see lots of discussion in the literature about saying, well, I can throw this term away when k squared is very small, and then I can treat the one over k squared as an effective theory. But that's not true, because even that one is telling you that you can't use the standard um, Dyson Wick expansion, which is what people use. You have to change the vacuum. You have to continue even the, even the piece that you like. You still have to continue that into the complex plane. OK, so um, the, the final comments, uh, I'll, I'll just state them. They're very straightforward. Um, for quantum field theory to be physically rele relevant, it must be formulatable in a Hilbert space with an inner product that is time independent, finite, and non-negative. However, in and of itself, specifying an action in a set of canonical commutators is not enough to either fix the Hilbert space 
or specify the appropriate inner product. Ordinarily, one supplements these requirements with the additional, generally regarded as self-evident requirement, that the fields in the Hamiltonian of the theory be Hermitian, and that the inner product be the standard, presumed finite, Dirac, uh, NN1. However, this is not automatic for any theory, and you have to check on a case-by-case -case basis. We've presented a procedure for doing so. The procedure is based on the occupation number space representation to construct an equivalent wave mechanics from which we can check for the normalizability of the vacuum and accordingly of the states that can be excited out of, out of it. An alternative but equivalent approach is to check whether or not the Minkowski time, time path integral with the real measure exists. If it does not, then the standard in a product is not finite and it's not the right one for the theory. I've used the occupation number space to find a, a case, a second order plus fourth order scalar theory in which the standard inner product actually is not finite. In this example, the Minkowski time path integral with the real measure diverges, even though the Euclidean time path integral does not. Even though contributions from the Wick contour are usually ignored, in this case, they cannot be. Thus, the use of Euclidean time path integral can be misleading. And even if the Euclidean time path integral is well behaved, it only gives a good description of the theory if the Minkowski time path integral is well behaved too. Since vacuum vacuum is not finite, use of the standard Feynman rules is not valid. With these rules not only leading to states with negative norm, they lead to states with infinite negative norm. This lack of finiteness means the Hamiltonian is not adjoint, self adjoint when acting on those particular states. However, the Hamiltonian of the second order plus fourth order scalar theory is PT symmetric. So we can use the techniques of PT symmetry and continue the fields in the Hamiltonian into the complex plane. Then there's a domain in the complex plane in which one can define an appropriate time independent positive and finite inner product, viz the overlap, right left overlap of left and right eigenstates of the Hamiltonian with the resulting vacuum state being normalizable with there being no states with negative or infinite norm. In this complex domain, it is the Euclidean time integral that diverges while the Minkowski time path integral does not. So again, there are contributions from the Wick contour. Finally, in this complex domain, the second order plus fourth order scalar field theory is fully consistent, unitary, and renormalizable, with this analysis being relevant for the construction of a consistent quantum theory of gravity. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very, very nice talk. The sixth speaker. Okay, so okay, Alexander, please go ahead. Zaharov. You have to unmute. May I ask? Yes. Something? Okay. Uh, the question is: uh, Your consideration is in some way related to the Hag theorem, or different? No, not really. The Hogg theorem, as I understand it, is you make a what you think is a unitary transformation from one Hilbert space to the other, but then you discover that 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 it's not a valid transformation. I'm not making I'm not I'm not using the wrong Hilbert space. I think what you're asking me is if I were to work in the Dirac Hilbert space and I tried to get from that one to the PT uh, Hilbert space, Hogg's theorem was telling me I couldn't do it. So I don't do that. I stay. I go. I find the Hilbert space first and work in that complete. Working that all together. Oh, I see. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.